Chapter 3 of The Boy Scouts on the Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Nair. The Boy Scouts on the Trail by Herbert Carter. Chapter 3 A Strange Discovery. How about this for a campsite, Thad? asked Alan, half an hour later. Looks fishy around here, for a fact, remarked Step Hen, just as if he knew all about such things, when, truth to tell, he had a lot to learn before he could call himself much of a woodsman. Wonder if there's any chance of finding that bee tree you said you was going to show me sometime when we got up in Maine? spoke up Bumpus who had managed, for the time being, to put his troubles out of his mind, for Thad assured him that, after sleeping over it, most likely he would remember some little incident connected with his entering the bank on that last morning in Cranford, and which would prove to his satisfaction that he must have delivered the letter there. Well, said Alan, the main boy, it's pretty late in the season to talk about bee trees, for I doubt if we'll find any of the little buzzers flying, and it's really necessary to have that happen in order to locate the hive, but I'm going to keep my eye open all the time, Bumpus, and try and accommodate you. But just think of getting whole heaps of rich, ripe honey, ejaculated Giraffe, who dearly loved eating. Say, wouldn't we have flapjacks every morning then, boys, with honey to smear over them an inch thick? Mm. Mm, take me to that bee tree as soon as you locate it, Alan, and give me an axe. I promise to cut her down, remember that. And I hope to hold you to that promise, Giraffe, returned the assistant patrol leader. But what do you say, Thad? Shall we stop here? What do the guides say? How about it, Sabattis, Eli, Jim? Will we be apt to pick up a mess of trout here, do you think? And Thad turned to the bronzed main men, who nodded their heads, and one after the other promised that if the boys knew how to handle their rods, there should be little difficulty in securing all they wanted, for a better pool could not be found along the river. A little side stream came into the main river with a noisy rush, falling from a ledge, and under the cascade there was a very deep place, where the trout were likely to stay until the coming of thick ice caused them to bury themselves in the mud, after the fashion of most fish until the ice went out in the spring. Accordingly, a landing was made, and soon all was bustle, the boys working with the three guides, as became true scouts, eager to learn all the little wrinkles of life in the open. The tents were soon erected. There were just two of these, and, as this was apt to make it rather crowded, the guides had offered to sleep outside except on any real stormy nights. They were hardened to the weather, and thought little of such a small matter. Of course, Giraffe looked after making the fireplace, for he would not hear of anybody else having anything to do with that part of the program, and Thad generally let the tall scout have his own way about this one matter. He fancied that it might keep Giraffe out of mischief, as well as employ his time, and save the guides considerable work. And Giraffe certainly did extract more pleasure in making a fine cooking fire than anyone Thad had ever seen. After supper was done, he usually insisted on having a rousing campfire, around which they could sit with hands clasped about their knees, or else lie in comfortable attitudes on their several blankets, while they coaxed the guides to tell them stories of the woods and the big animals they had come in contact with during the years spent in serving hunting parties on the trail of deer and moose. Jim and Eli did about all the talking, for it was difficult to get Sabattis to say anything about his experiences, though everyone just knew the old Indian must be as full of thrilling yarns as an egg is of meat, as Step Hen put it. Thad and Alan, meanwhile, had taken their rods, and set to work trying to coax the shy trout to bite the bait they offered them. Both boys were good fishermen, and had had considerable experience in the ways of the speckled beauties, so that in the end, they succeeded in getting a pretty mess of the trout, enough to give them a fine feast that evening. One of the guides was set to work cleaning the fish even before the boys stopped taking them in, and about the time the sun sank out of sight in the west, 
a most delicious odor began to arise, that Giraffe sniffed with his eyes glistening, for this was the first mess of trout they had caught on this expedition. Later on the whole of them sat around the fire, and enjoyed one of the most tasty dishes ever placed before a hungry boy, fresh brook trout, rolled in cracker crumbs, and done to a turn in hot grease extracted from several pieces of salt pork. Only hope we get a few more chances to feast on this thing before the season's up, or the cold drives the trout into winter quarters, remarked Giraffe, as he heaved a sigh of regret because the pan was now empty. For eight hungry people, it was of course necessary to use both large skillets, and even then, the supply never exceeded the demand. But why should we bother our heads about this season when we're away up here and with no one to know what we're doing? demanded Step Hen. That's just it, Step Hen, replied Thad, who seemed to think the question was intended for him. We're Boy Scouts, and when we joined the organization, every one of us subscribed to certain rules, twelve in number, you remember. Could you repeat those twelve cardinal principles of the Scouts for me right now, Step Hen? The boy addressed turned a little red in the face, while the two main guides listened intently, evidently very much interested. Sabatis did not seem to pay the least attention to what was going on, though that may just have been his way. These Indian guides have a habit of hearing when nobody expects it. Oh, sure I can, Step Hen made answer, cheerfully enough. Then please, let us hear them, continued Thad. Well, the scout went on to say, as if he easily knew the list by heart, he promises to the best of his ability to be trustworthy, loyal, helpful to others, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient to his superiors, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. All right, Step Hen, the scoutmaster remarked, the great state of Maine trusts us. We've taken out licenses to shoot up here. We're entitled to a certain number of deer and one moose apiece, and in accepting these favors, we virtually agreed to refrain from breaking the laws. Can a scout be trustworthy who deliberately breaks a law, like the killing of game or the taking of fish out of season, when there's no real excuse for it? Well, perhaps you're right, Thad, grumbled the other rather loath to see the point. But suppose now, I was lost in these here big pine woods and hungry, near to starving. I knew the season for trout was up, but it was a case of root, hog, or die with poor Step Hen. Would you blame me then if I just dropped a line to Mr. Trout and invited him to waltz into my little frying pan? Thad smiled. There may be cases where breaking the game law is justifiable, he remarked, and I'm not saying otherwise. I think that would be one of them. A fellow shouldn't be compelled to starve with game around him because certain men have decided that, as a rule, the laws ought to be made just so-and-so. But Step Hen, if he were really just to his better self, I believe that scout would, when he had reached a point of safety, go to a game warden, state the case, and offer to pay the fine, if it had to be imposed. I rather guess the great state of Maine would do the generous thing and remit such a fine. Well, that lets Giraffe out, I see, remarked the still unconvinced Step Hen, because he's always at the starving point. All the same, boys, as true scouts, I hope none of you will bring discredit on the name of the Silver Fox Patrol by doing anything that is going to get us into trouble in case we happen to meet a game warden. For one, I'd like to look him in the eye and feel my conscience clear. And after that, Thad changed the subject, with the hope that the weak member might, when he had digested all that had been said, see the thing in its best light. There's one thing we don't want to forget. Thad remarked later on, as some of the boys began to manifest a desire for a little roughhouse time. "'What's that, Thad?' asked Alan, though doubtless he could already give a fair guess as to what the reply was going to be, since he had seen signs of a frown on the forehead of the scoutmaster when the noise broke out. 
We mustn't forget, said Thad, that right now we're on the border of the big game country, and any time we're apt to run across signs of deer and moose. Now, when hunters who know their business go into the wilderness, they don't pick up a row and make all sorts of a racket that would tell the timid woods folks a delegation of town people had invaded their haunts. If they did, they'd not be apt to find Mr. Moose within 20 miles. How about that, Alan? You're right, Thad, replied the Maine boy, smiling. Most of the deer hunters are what we call still hunters. They look for their game and creep up on it from the leeward side, with the wind coming from the deer. There is no dog chasing deer allowed in the state, or in New York any longer, so the noise and excitement is all gone. And in a noisy camp, you'll find mighty few deer taken. It's the quiet, earnest fellows who succeed in getting the game up here. You hear that, scouts, said Thad, pleasantly. We want game the worst kind, as well as to overtake that gentleman who is ahead of us, and whose trail we're now following. So, if you please, we'll dispense with the usual bugle blasts and the horseplay while in camp here. Let's have a jolly good time, which I believe is possible among boys without wrestling and singing and rough play. Am I right, Step Hen, Giraffe, Davy, Bumpus? You are every time, Thad, said Bumpus, and the other three were quick to take their cue so that from this hour it seemed likely that the scouts, who were, for the time being, playing the part of big game hunters, meant to carry out the role to the letter. Jim looked at Eli, nodded his head, and winked. It was as though one guide had said to the other that Thad Brewster knew his business all right. About half an hour later, Step Hen was seen to be moving about in the bushes near the edge of the camp, with his head bent low. Now, everyone knew what such an attitude meant when it was Step Hen who assumed it. He had lost something, as usual. "'What's gone this time, Step Hen?' asked Thad. "'That little jinx been around again, hooking your things?' demanded Giraffe, who always made all manner of fun of the careless scout whenever he complained that he was unable to find a certain thing, which he felt just sure he had laid aside only a minute before." As usual, Step Hen was simply positive that he could not have himself mislaid his property. Proven guilty on numerous previous occasions did not seem to convince the boy that he could ever do such a silly thing again. This was always a case of where some mischievous chum had been playing a trick on him. Why, it's that little bundle I fetched along, with a black piece of waterproof cloth around it, torn from an old raincoat, he explained as he continued to poke among the bushes. It's got some things in it that I thought I'd likely need up here, in case I happened to get lost. Among others, a cute little compass, an extra box of parlor matches that you just can't blow out in any wind, and some other little wrinkles. Sounds all to the good, Step Hen, Thad went on to remark, and I've no doubt that if you ever did have the misfortune to get lost while up here in Maine, that same little packet would come in mighty handy, providing you chance to have it with you at the time. If it was in camp, why, it couldn't do you any good. But what makes you think it's gone now? I had it in my hand not ten minutes ago and laid it carefully aside, Step Hen went on in a whining tone as though he felt hurt, but which was doubtless only assumed for the purpose of arousing sympathy. Oh, you can grin as much as you want, Giraffe and Davy, but it's so this time. I was careful as could be, and now she's gone. I just know one of you fellers scooped that packet and hid the same in the bushes just to give me a rough jolt, and that's why I'm hunting for it right now. Thad was on his feet at the time, and with a smile at the old complaint, which he had heard Step Hen make, time without end, only to find himself compelled to eat his words, as Giraffe put it, he sauntered away, meaning to take a little look around before turning in. Two minutes later, Step Hen gave a little gurgling cry. Found it? asked Giraffe, with an interested air. Just like I said was the case, came from Step Hen in the bushes close by. 
The feller that took it just gave it a flirt, and over she came right here. What? Well, I declare, that's mighty funny now. And he pushed his way into view, carrying some object in his hand, at which he was staring incredulously. Say, that ain't your packet, is it, Step Hen? demanded Giraffe. I should say it wasn't, replied the other scout. But tell me, fellers, how in the wide world now do you suppose this came in them bushes? And he held up what seemed to be a small handbag of black leather, apparently weighty, and very much used. End of chapter 3